great joy to be here with you again. And I want us to thank the worship team. What an outstanding, outstanding team. Thank you so much. In Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. God wants us to live by faith. Wants our faith level, our trust level to be up. And he says, and uh, he says, also he said, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So I want to talk today about disappointment and the impact of disappointment that causes us to draw back. Because it's not the time to draw back now, it's the time to let faith rise in our hearts and begin to break out of the limitations and confinements we've experienced. You say amen. The message I'm going to share with you today is deal with your disappointment. And uh, it comes out of my own uh, time with the Lord, and God began to speak to me about this very thing recently, and uh, He showed me a lot of things I didn't know. So the message is shaped out of the things that He spoke to me. And uh, disappointments are part of everyone's life. There's no one escapes disappointments, and if you want to check the Bible out, you find it's full of people who had massive disappointments. They're everywhere. What about Abraham, who had a promise that he would have a child, and now he's in his 90s and no sign of a child? What about Sarah, who has a promise of a child, now she's barren, doesn't bear anymore? Promise that God had given them, and yet there doesn't seem to be anything happening. What about Esau, who gave up his birthright, and then the blessing was taken from him, he wept bitterly. Jacob, all of the characters of the Bible had these disappointments. Moses expected everyone would understand God was raising him up to be a deliverer, and they didn't, and he ended up in the wilderness for 40 years, disappointed. He came back, and his first attempt to rescue the people of God made it worse for them, disappointment. I think when God's involved in it a bit, it makes it even harder to handle when you believe he's told you to take a certain path, and then it seems to be harder or different or doesn't seem to go like you expected, disappointment. And you find it right through. You find it Joshua. They were doing so well in their first battle at Jericho. Then they have their next battle. They're sure they're going to win that. Suddenly they're beaten. Disappointment. They wept bitterly. And it goes on through the Bible. You think of David. He's, he's, he's slain Goliath. He's now leading the army. And next thing, he's in the wilderness being hounded and pursued. Disappointment. He forms friends with people and they get murdered. Disappointment. This is the story right through the Bible of people going through these things. What about Jesus who gave his life, poured out his heart in ministry, and then everyone that was with him left him? Disappointing. It's disappointing. Very disappointing. Very disappointing. What about Peter when he realized that he'd made such great promises to Jesus and then he ran away when he got a little bit of pressure? It says he wept bitterly, disappointed in himself. So disappointment is a part of the life. It's the part of the Bible story. And we find that in the midst of disappointment, God comes through and something better can happen. I remember when we first uh, tried to buy a house, I went to this place, it looked good, and so we went and checked it all out and did all the necessary work, and I put in an offer, and, and uh, the guy accepted it, and uh, I gave him a dollar, which is actually illegal then, binding on this thing, and, uh, and I'm praying, Lord, I give it to you. If you want us to have it, want your will, Lord, and, and Lord, he surrendered it all to you. Next day, the guy quit on me, and he sold it to someone else. To say I felt disappointment is, is under, understatement. Why? And uh, anyway, we had another disappointment, and then finally we came to the house, and by then my whole posture around it was completely different. Two years later, I had a chance to revisit the house that we had lost, and I said, oh, oh, how long have you been here? They said, oh, about two years. And I said, how's it going? How are you enjoying the house? He said, it's terrible. He said, we had so much problem. We put thousands of dollars into repairs. He was a home handyman. He never did a good job. And we've had to do plumbing and wiring and roofing and every kind of thing. We are regretting that we bought this house. So, so what was disappointing to me, in spite of putting it in the Lord's hands and, and trusting him to guide me, God was saving me and protecting me for something far worse. He had something much better in mind. So this is the problem with disappointments, when, that when you have them, you feel them deeply, but often God has got something better just around the corner. Get the idea? So I want to just share some, share some things about it, because this period of COVID, if there's one thing you could characterize it by, is disappointments. 
and it's been a global thing. And so disappointments are everywhere. If you haven't been disappointed, I don't know where you've been. Canceled, canceled church gatherings. I mean, I just wept being here. I've missed it so much. The disappointment of not being able to gather. And then we did gather, only a few people. You know, the, the canceled weddings, people unable to do a wedding. Canceled funerals, people couldn't come to the funeral. The grief and disappointment for people. People stuck in MIQ and their loved ones dying. They can't visit them. The disappointment's enormous. Canceled tra travel plans. Birthdays you couldn't hold. It just goes on and on and on. Close relatives in hospital and you're not allowed to visit. Can you understand we're in a, in, a, in a culture, in a global situation where disappointment is everywhere and people feel it and it's affected them. And that's why I want to talk about this. You think about people who excluded from school, having to do work at home, struggling with it all. What about those excluded from sports events? What about the grief of those who made a decision not to get a vaccine and then lost the job they'd invested their life in? See, the disappointment, I'm not commenting on the rights or wrongs, I'm just talking about the human condition of being disappointed. What about those who have tried hard to build a business and then through no fault of their own, all these closures and red lights and things like that, it's caused them to lose their business, lose their livelihood, lose everything they've built over years. Disappointment, yeah. deep disappointment. Think about it. And there's, there's, there's lots of ways that people become disappointed. We can become disappointed in ourselves. We can become disappointed in friends. We can become disappointed in leaders. We can become disappointed in pastors, in people we've trusted. It's like disappointment is part of the human condition. It's impossible to walk through life without facing it. But if you learn what it is and how to deal with it, you can become a better person, a more resilient person, someone who's able to stand up and overcome setbacks quickly. Some people have got little resilience, a little setback, and then they collapse. They take a victim posture and it's life's not fair. But that's not men of faith. Men of faith don't do that. Men of faith, maybe they fall back, but then they get back up and trust God and move on. And that's why I'm speaking into this because I, I don't think there's anyone that hasn't had some form of disappointment. And what I'm wanting to ensure, what I felt the Lord saying is that your disappointments can cause you to draw back and then that affects your whole future. That's why we want to look about dealing with that. What about when family stand against you and react because you made a decision to receive Christ? It's disappointing. What about if there's been abuse in the family and no one will acknowledge the injustice? Deep disappointment. And this is happening in our midst. So what is disappointment? It's, it's, it's basically an unmet expectation. We have an expectation, a passion, a longing for something, and it doesn't come about. Somehow, it doesn't happen. Disappointment's a feeling of sadness and grief which can turn to anger and resentment because something didn't turn out like we expected. So if you'd never had any expectations, you wouldn't have disappointment. But if you've been disappointed, you can't just drop your expectations so you don't want to be disappointed again or you live a life that's empty and passionless and no vision, no direction. We've got to overcome disappointments and step up. Disappointment, feeling unhappy. So there's basically three sources of disappointment. One source of disappointment is ourselves. When we've hoped we would be better than we were and then failed to live up to what we said. You think of Peter after he betrayed Jesus, weeping bitterly in disappointment, having said, I'll be with you. Even if everyone else leaves you, I'll be with you, and then finds he failed. The person who said they'd never have another drink and then they fall one day. And, and, and the disappointment is in their heart. You know, disappointment comes. I can remember trying to overcome things that came and arose from my family background and remember seeing that very thing in my family and, and weeping with disappointment, saying, God, help me understand how this is happening and what I can do to shift this. What about other people that fail to meet our expectations? You think of Judas in the Bible. Their friend, he ate with them, drank with them, slept with them, walked with them, ministered with them, and then he shattered their world. Is there anyone shattered your world? You trusted them and then they let you down? Disappointment, it doesn't go away. 
What about life circumstance? Sometimes it's just life circumstances. Things don't happen like we think. Think about the, the disciples. You know, they're on the crest of their ministry success, and then suddenly Jesus is dead and gone. The disappointment is devastating. It goes on and on and on. Life circumstances. You can have setback after setback. I can remember trusting and giving my life to serve a leader, and when he fell in adultery, it, it was disappointing. And I had to face, like everyone does with disappointment, will you let someone else's actions define you and your future, or will you trust God and walk your way out of the disappointment? And so we have to face these things, and some of you will be, be feeling these things right now. So when we set our heart on people, and set our heart and hope on circumstances, we become open for disappointment. Notice what it says about God. He says in Romans 15, 13, now may the God of hope, so hope has to do with expectation for the future. Now, now God wants to do something in your life. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Ghost. So God's not wanting us to live in disappointment. He doesn't want you gripped by disappointment. He doesn't want you living with the feelings of disappointment and then protecting yourself from further disappointment. He's the God of all hope. He's the God who is the power of resurrection. He can resurrect dreams. He can lift you up again. He's the God who can come into the broken heart and fix it. Well, thank you very much. That's really good. Think about that. Just what I needed. God is a God of resurrection. We're celebrating the resurrection. When dreams are lost, when love is gone, God can resurrect it in your heart. Because he's the God of resurrection. So notice here it says in uh, Romans, uh, in Psalm 112, 7 and 8, don't be afraid of evil tidings. He won't be afraid of evil tidings because his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He won't be afraid. So when we're established in the Lord, Bad news comes and just flows over us. We don't get stuck on the negative stuff on TV. We don't get stuck on all the bad things that are happening because our heart is fixed somewhere else. When you have disappointment, it'll fill you with sadness. You have feelings of sadness and grief. God wants your heart filled with hope and joy, peace. The future's never looking better. So you can look at the news. The news, they're talking again. It seems like, for those who are around my, uh, Bob's age and my age or something, it seems, wait a minute, they're all talking about World War III. Wait a minute, all that stuff they were talking about years ago. There was a whole generation got terrorized by the prospect of a global war. And now here it is again. But we went through that and got through all of that and overcame all of that. Don't listen to all that stuff. Set your heart on the unchanging one, Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is, this is uh, some things that the Lord showed me about disappointment because he was talking to me in my private journaling about some of my own disappointments. And uh, we had many travel plans. We had many ministry plans. We had a whole lot of plans covering about two or three years. And, or, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you can cancel them all. None of them are going to happen. And he told me that in the beginning, before the COVID thing had sprung on the world. And uh, so at least I had a heads up, but in the end, I had to come and face that all the things, the dreams and the plans we had over the next two years, that none of them would eventuate. There was a lot of money involved in it, none of which was returned. In other words, disappointment. You've got to deal with disappointments. And uh, so the Lord was speaking to me about my own disappointment. So let me give you five things that he spoke to me about disappointment. Number one, disappointments accumulate. They accumulate. It's very tempting to ignore your disappointments and just to kind of distract yourself. But the pain and grief of, of disappointment accumulates. And then when people react, they're not reacting out of a little disappointment, they're reacting out of the accumulation of it. That's why people start to get angry and suddenly just react out of proportion. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, it's the tree of life. So when you have your hopes or your expectations are broken, it affects your heart, it affects passion, it affects motivation, it affects your dreams, it affects your future. The heart being sick means it's grieved or wounded or distressed. 
So when this repeated postponement of plans, and we've ha all had that, it's going to be open, now it's closed. Going to be able to gather, now you can't gather. All of that kind of stuff, it actually accumulates in its effect. And we want to have an opportunity for us today to actually just bring that to the Lord and let's believe for the touch of God to come back on our life again. We don't want to just arrive, but we're shut down. We want to now break out. Amen? Amen. So, so that's the first thing then is that uh, appointment, disappointments accumulate in the effect and eventually people just lose heart and become disheartened, discouraged. Does that happen to you? Then today you need to let God help you with that. The second thing is disappointments cause a loss of passion and desire. Disappointments cause a loss of passion and desire. And that affects all relationships. So when you're disappointed in a romantic relationship, then your love, your passion, your heart begins to dry up. You, you lose love. You think of many marriages that started passionate and then through multitudes of disappointments, gradually love died. And usually people don't notice their love is dying because they didn't address the disappointments on the way. And in Proverbs 4, 23, we're to keep our heart diligently because out of our hearts spring the issues of life. So accumulated disappointments, you just lose your passion, lose your desire. So what has happened to your faith in Christ? What has happened to your first love? What has happened to you, just your, your joy in the Lord over two years of accumulated disappointments? So you've got to ask yourself that because when we stop and think, how is my walk with God now? I think many will find the fire has become very lukewarm. And we're here, but nevertheless something changed because of the disappointments. And God wants to do something about that, wants, wants a fresh fire to come upon our life. Here's the third thing. Disappointments, disappointments, they lead to fear of further disappointment. So when you let a disappointments accumulate, then fear starts to grow. Fear is a spirit. It's the opposite to faith. And so then what people do is that when fear, hope and expectation is gradually replaced by disappointment, then people become afraid of further disappointments and won't make plans or take risks. That's not the life of faith. That's not the life of faith. Here's the fourth thing the Lord showed me about it. And he was talking to me about where I was at and his desire for me to move now. Okay, here's the fourth one he told me. He said that disappointments are the enemy of intimacy and destiny. Disappointments are an enemy of intimacy and intimate relationship with God and of destiny, fulfilling the dream of God. Why is that? Because disappointments cause you to call in your passion. People often blame God because things haven't worked out like they thought. And once you lose your passion, you lose your willingness to trust. Say that again. When you lose your passion for God, you lose the willingness to trust Him. And then you begin to draw back. The desire to form new, to avoid the disappointment, cause people to just wall their heart. I don't want to be disappointed again. I don't want to have a hope and a plan in case I get disappointed again. So now people are more concerned about protecting themselves and they become indifferent now. And so we just go through the motions. How's your prayer life going right now? How's your time with God going right now? Is it full of passion, expectation, or is something gone gradually over two years? See, because we don't feel, uh, we no longer trust God, because we feel I've been disappointed so many, by so many things, then we focus on staying safe. When you focus on staying safe, you can't fulfill God's destiny, because God's destiny requires you step out of your comfort zone. All, all growth, all walks of faith are outside the comfort zone. So for the last two years, you've had the media, you've had the government, you've had everyone saying, be safe. Look after yourself. Be afraid. Now that, I'm not commenting on whether the message is right or wrong or anything. I'm just saying that when you're exposed to that day after day for two years, it affects how you think and do life. And that is the problem. We're not going to get into the right and wrong about who made this decision or that decision. We're just saying this is what we've walked through. Now look at the impact and let's move from that positioning. May I say that? That's why I say, you know, the just will live by faith. God has no pleasure if we draw back. 
So drawing back to save ourselves is not going to bring pleasure to God because we're not stretching and reaching people. I won't go talk to that person. I might catch something. I won't go love that person in case I catch something. In other words, it's all about in case something happens to me. I'm just totally uh, caught up with saving myself. Wow. See? So, so disappointment is more than just an emotion. If you don't deal with it, it leads you to separate from a life of faith and pleasing God. Whoa. Okay, here's the fifth one the Lord told me. Enjoying this? I see you already quiet over this, but must be hitting home. <laughs> I remember thinking, Lord, I don't know whether I want to share this one. <laughs> Disappointments are exploited by Satan as a weapon of warfare against us. And we've ever thought about that. Why? Because he wants you to brood over your disappointments. When you brood over your disappointments, you become more sad and more angry. And if you're in a season of disappointment, then the enemy wants you to keep focusing on what went wrong. What went wrong was yesterday. What are you going to do today? What's going to happen tomorrow? You can't change what happened before. You can just address how it's impacted you and move forward. So don't get focused on everything that went wrong. Focus on what God is doing. Think about that. So here's a, here's a key thing is that Jesus revealed that part of God's plan and destiny involved him suffering. And he embraced it. Let's read in Matthew 16, 21. And it tells us from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he was gonna to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests, and the tribes and be killed and raise the third day. So what are you drawn to there? Raise the third day or suffer and be killed? Well, apparently all they got was to suffer and be killed. They didn't hear the raise the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, stop it, <laughs> stop it. Be it far from you, pity yourself. This shall not happen to you. And he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. <laughs> so Peter is having a huge blow. He's got this plan that now they're at the peak of their ministry. He's famous. The disciples are famous. Nothing could be better. They're really on a winner. And now suddenly, all his expectations have been shattered, and he's deeply disappointed at the prospect. And so Satan invades his thinking in that moment of disappointment. And his response is to reject the very core of what it means to be a believer. Let's have a look how, how Jesus responds. He, he makes two responses. The first one is a sharp rebuke. Now, remember what he's saying. He's saying, oh, my, oh Jesus, you just need to protect yourself. You need to look out for yourself. Now, listen, don't let that happen to you. Now, listen, you should shut the door and lock yourself in and don't let them come for you. C can you understand that? is the mentality he's saying. And, and so the first thing is Jesus rebukes him. Jesus makes a strong personal stand against that mentality. Think about that. The second thing Jesus does is he brings revelation on that mentality on, on how God operates. Here's what he says. Firstly, he says, the source of that self-preservation thinking is demonic. Second thing, the mindset of resistance to sacrifice is an offense and a stumbling block that would hinder Jesus in his ministry. In other words, that mindset of looking after number one is a stumbling block to walking out the purpose of God. It's just completely contrary. Thirdly, you notice he said, this opinion or mindset is self-centered and it's completely opposed to the things God values. You savor the things of men, not the things of God. And then he says what the core foundation is to follow him. The core foundation is you lay aside self-interest and embrace sacrificial service. Deny yourself take up your cross and follow him. So think about this, the season of COVID, the message daily has been one of fear and self-protection. In other words, you've had two years of programming 
that in some ways is completely contrary to the spirit of following Christ. And it will have affected you. Now, get this. So firstly, it's appropriate to be careful when there are real risks. It's quite okay and appropriate if there's a real risk to take care. However, we need to reject that mentality as being a way of life. It is not the way of life of a believer. That's not what we're called to. We're called to a life that's bigger than me. As I say, we're called to a life that's bigger than me. We're called to a life bigger than me. Amen. You're called to community. You're called to mission and service. So when fear and self-protection becomes our mentality, we are directly opposing Jesus' commands. I don't let the stuff think in because it really impacted me when I was having my devotion with the Lord. He just dropped these things into me. We're called to a life of faith. We're called to a life of service. We're called to a life of investing in people and broken people. We're called to a life of mission. We're called to lay down our lives so that others can come into the kingdom of God. So the whole mentality that people have picked up through the COVID season is in opposition to the direct commands of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying take un unreasonable risks. I'm not saying being foolish or stupid. I think we need to actually, if there are real risks, to actually be cautious and careful. And however, it's the mentality that it's all about me and looking after me, that's what I'm wanting to go for today. Get any idea? Here's this. The safe zone during COVID becomes your prison zone when the risk is gone. Think about it. Your safe zone during COVID then turns into your prison zone when the risk is gone. And it's quite amazing that last year, I've known more than one person that when the risk lifted, they decided they stay home the rest of the year. Right. You understand? That the safe zone turned into a prison zone. Yeah. Their freedom was available, but they had lost it because of their fear and wrong perspective. Hey, you're all real quiet today. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we've got to see then, so I'll leave you a couple of examples in the Bible of overcoming disappointment. Then I'll give you a few steps and let's have a time to reach out and honor God and let go of disappointments and have a fresh encounter with God. What do you reckon? Okay, well, here's a couple of examples, a couple of really good ones. The first one comes from the example of David in 1 Samuel 30. Remember with David, 1 Samuel 30, David had been out fighting all the battles. He comes back to his home. What's he expecting? He's expecting homecoming. And what does he find? The place is burnt with fire. His wife and kids are gone. Everything of value is taken. The whole place is being burnt to the ground. Is that disappointment? It looked like Ukraine. Disappointment. And so there were two ways you could respond. His men responded by, to the disappointment by being angry and looking for someone to blame. David responded to the disappointment. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, he strengthened himself in the Lord. If you've been through disappointments, which we have, strengthen yourself in the Lord. If you've been through disappointments, don't get angry and blaming and play it safe. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. As we come out of this COVID season, we must strengthen ourselves in God again. We must let our faith touch to come back up again. We must let the joy of serving Him, the passion of being in His presence again. Think about that. See, so God wants you to develop great resilience. Resilience is the ability to recover quickly from a setback. If you're a parent, teach your children resilience. They get disappointed, teach them how to get back up, get going again. Amen? Second great example of, of, uh, of people overcoming disappointment, it gives an insight. Each story of overcoming disappointment, there's, an, there's a lesson in it. Here's another one. Remember, after Jesus uh, had uh, died, gone to the cross, there were two disciples uh, and uh, took the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Uh, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. They talked together of the things which had happened. And while they conversed, Jesus drew near, but their eyes were blinded. They couldn't recognize him. And uh, Jesus said, what kind of conversation you're having as you walk and you're so sad? 
There's no joy. I can't catch the joy here. I can't catch the hope here. I can't catch the life here. I just notice you're sad. And your talk is all sad as well. What's going on here? And he got them talking. And they said, oh, well, we had all these great hopes and now they've all gone. And he let them talk. He let them share their feelings, share all this stuff. And then he gave them a good old telling off. He said, you're just full of unbelief because you're centered on the problems that you're walking into and experiencing which are real and you haven't understood the power of God and the promises of God that would bring you out the other side of it. Notice that disappointment had blinded them to what God was doing. Disappointment affects the way you look at stuff. You see it through a negative filter. Everything seems a little negative and oh, I don't know, I don't know, you're holding back. It stopped them even seeing Jesus. So what did Jesus do to them? He took them into a fresh encounter. He shared the word of God. He pushed back on the spirit of unbelief, brought them into the truth of God's word, and then their eyes were opened. They encountered him, and their passion was restored. Their passion was restored. Their disappointment was removed. Their passion was restored. God's wanting to move you out of disappointment into a place of passion. You say Amen. We want our eyes open to what God is doing. The great opportunities ahead. A nation full of people disappointed. Oh, what a great hour for the church. What a great hour for people full of faith. What a great hour for people anointed in the Holy Ghost. What a great time to be bold. What a great time to be joyful. What a great time for the church to arise. Think about it. So let me get, the Lord was really good to me. He actually showed me exactly the steps to take to overcome my disappointments. You want me to share them with you? Yeah. Now, quite, it was, I, quite, he just, I just wrote it down as he was telling me. I thought, oh, well, it's sort of obvious. No, no, I never thought to do it. <laughs> Number one, identify your disappointments. Identify them. Make a list of them. Name them and speak them out. What were you expecting to happen that never happened? Who were you expecting to come through and they failed? Naming it is the first step to getting victory over it. Pretending it's not there or just bearing it like a lot of men do doesn't get you anywhere. Identify the disappointment. Secondly, there's emotions. You lost something. Something didn't happen. You feel something. So grieve over your disappointment. Grieve over it. Grieve over it. Grieve over it and bring it to the cross. Tears are a way of releasing sadness inside. Tears are a way of changing your your constitution. It actually brings a release for you. So come into the presence of God and bring your suffering and your sorrows and your griefs to him and release them to him and have a good cry over it. It's okay to do that because it just acknowledges I would never feel like this if I didn't have something I was passionate about. Here's a third one the Lord told me. I was a bit surprised by this one. He said, identify the ways you're trying to manage and control your your disappointment, the pain of it. In other words, have a look at how have I tried to control the pain? What have I tried to do to avoid facing I'm really disappointed and I'm I'm really and blah, 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 (laughs) you know, as people do. Think about it. How have you tried to control pain? Do you get distracted? Too much time on on TV, too much time in the media, too much time on TikTok, too much time on whatever. But you're just drawing into something to avoid actually facing, I'm really disappointed. I don't want to face it. So whatever we've done to try and control the pain, have we turned away from God? We're no longer praying, and we don't even know why we're not praying, but actually here's the reason you're disappointed in God. And so you're disappointed? Well, I just avoid them. So your prayer loses its passion. So avoidance is one way of of not facing or controlling disappointment. Think about it. Where did you draw back? From serving? From prayer? From giving? Where did you draw back? How did you try and manage your disappointment? That drawing back is your way of controlling it. That needs to be repented of and brought to the cross. God, I'm sorry. Instead of turning to you with my disappointment, I tried to control the pain and save myself. Jesus, I come to you. Here's the thing that the Lord really spoke to me very deeply and I began to really weep over. 
He says, do again the things connected to your first love because disappointment causes first love to diminish. That's a whole thing of itself. We need a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit for our love to be kindled again. You know, in Revelations 2, 4, he says, I have this against you, you've left your first love. Remember where you've fallen and do, repent and do again the first works. So think about your first love. And as I was going through this, I started to think about my, my first times with joy. I just love to be with her. And we would just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. We'd love to go out and just be together. There was certain music that was associated with that romantic time. It was like nothing was too much. And there were lots of first things in my life around that first love with her. And it's the same in our walk with God. We have that first encounter. Oh, it's so real and I'm loved. And tears flow and our heart comes alive. And it's no problem to pray. It's no problem to want to gather with God's people. It's no problem to want to, to, want to be in His presence and, and, and study His Word. Then something happens and the passion is lost. He says, remember what it was like when you just loved to be in His presence and you would just worship and worship. The Lord said to me, remember when you sit there and you'd play the accordion and worship me for hours on end. He said, I love that. So do it again, the first things. The first thing to do is to build an altar. God, I come to you and I let go of my disappointments. I let go of the sadness. I let go of the grief. I, I let go of all the ways I've tried to manage this. And I just come to build an altar again. I want the altar of my relationship with you to be reestablished. We begin to build our prayer life and start to fast again. Start to fast again. Start to get into the Word and study the Word because the Word of God lifts your hopes, lifts your faith, lifts you back up again. Meditate in the goodness of God. In other words, let your mind be focused back on Him again. Do the things that you used to do. I would love being in the Word and sitting over the Word. And I've got a new Bible. I got it, I think, about a year ago. It's, it's stuff everywhere in it. I just use the time to pour into the Word of God and, and allow it to get into my heart, to get a new joy to be with Him again. Connect to believers that, can, that are strong in their faith and prayer. Hang around them. Connect with them. Don't isolate. Connect with people that will shift your faith again. Step out of the comfort zone, into the risk zone with God. It's time to arise. It's time to let go of the disappointments. It's time for a fresh encounter with God. It's time to build that altar of first love again. Repair the altar of the Lord that's broken down for fresh fire from heaven. This is time for a fresh encounter with God. Time for us to arise again. Are you ready for that? Come on, let's stand to our, vo our feet. I want us to flow into a song and worship the Lord. Come on, let's flow into a song and let's lift our hands to the Lord. Maybe some of you want to come to the front and build an altar to the Lord. I want us to believe for fresh fire to come from heaven. God, as we build an altar again, a personal commitment and sacrifice, we're asking for fire to come from heaven. Come on, let's build an altar to Him. Let's repair the altar of the Lord. Our altar is built in our heart. Lord, today, I come with my disappointments and I put them on the altar. I bring them to the cross. Lord, today, I bring my fears. I put them on the altar. I bring them to the cross. Lord, today, I'm asking for 
from fresh fire. Fresh fire from heaven. Some of you may want to come forward. Build your own personal altar in the front. If you're watching online, you can do that too. Or you may just want to, wherever you are, say, God, here I am. I'm sad. I bring my sadness to you, Lord. I exchange it for new hope and joy. You are the God of all hope. You fill us with joy and peace. If we believe. is here. The heavens are open. Heavens are open. We 
I'm surrounded by angels. His glory is in the house. you are Lord reach out to Jesus now whatever you need whatever the circumstances the pain the disappointment give it to him hunger for more of you. Fresh fire. Fresh encounters. How we love you, Lord. We come before you in honor and celebration of who you are. You heal the broken heart. You bind up all their wounds. You set the captives free. As we're in your presence right now, Lord, I speak to every spirit of fear. I forbid the operation of fear against the people of this church. I command every spirit of fear, anxiety, worry. I command you to go now in Jesus' name. One, two, three, loose. Father, we thank you, the God of all hope, who fills us with joy and peace through believing. Lord, today we release your peace into the house. One. Two, three, peace. We thank you for one another. Thank you for our pastors and leaders. We thank you for the spirit of faith in the house. We decree advancement. We decree enlargement. We decree new territories, new people. We decree young people coming in. We decree business people coming in. We decree broken people coming in. We decree a new season of people coming in, of this house being a place where people are fed and cared for. Father, I'm asking now that fire would come from heaven and begin to sit on people. Fire. Fire from before your throne. One. Two. Three. Fire. Let the fire of God come. such a presence of God here hard to even stand those watching online just let the presence of God impact you wherever you are maybe people need ministry you could pray for them 
It's just such a holy presence of God here. I miss this. When we started worshiping earlier on, I started to cry. I said, God, I've been so missing this. Somehow it's different alone. It's just something when you're together. If you're watching online, you can come possibly. Come next week. Don't let people fill you with fear and say, don't come. It's a fear-based thing. Why would you listen to the voice of fear? When God's presence is so good. God bless you. What a great day this has been. What a great day. And thank you again, Pastor Dave and Kay, for leading us through this difficult season. Let's give them a clap. Just appreciate them.